Firstly, thanks for the opportunity to talk to you today about what is a really interesting site. Um, I'm really proud to be talking to you about it, partly because the group I work with up in Strecker were fantastic. Their enthusiasm was just overwhelming. Their support and hospitality during the project. Um, so it's a real good feel, feel good project and it came to, came to good results in the end. We got a lot from what was quite a short excavation of 12 days. We got a lot of information on a not often studied period and, and type of building. Um, usually buildings around 200 years old might be, might be passed by for something more interesting or older, but hopefully by the end of the talk today um, you'll know a bit more about it and find it as interesting as I did. And if you look out for some of the images of the excavation, you might see a piece of the structure that you had to eat at your break today. So, just to give you a little... I'll just give you a little background to why it happened in the first place, um, how it was instigated, um, the, the role that we had to play, the role that the community had to play, and the role that Strachan District the Local History Society had to play. play. <clears throat> and then I'll show you Ty Call and its landscape to give you an impression of where it stands and why it was important, perhaps why it became an inn, and show you where the drover's roots were. Um, and then I'll show you quite a lot of detail on the excavation, at least in some of the images. I'll try and get across what we found and and as little images as possible and try and give you some of the results as clearly as possible. Um, I'll then go into a bit of the post-excavation and what we found from that. And then ultimately the publication, which was just Tuesday this week, which is exactly one year after our trial touched the ground, which is, I'm sure you'll agree, is quite, quite a quick turnaround. Um, and then just to conclude, what was the trigger for the demise of the 18th century inn? So I'll leave you right to the end for that one, sorry. <laughs> So, for background, um, Donald Adamson, now Dr. Donald Adamson, uh, conducted his PhD research on the Argyll area and also in Sutherland, where he also hopes to look at another inn in the near future, and hopefully he'll ask me to come along again. Um, so he did it on cattle droving, and, and there were other trades going on, like grain, etc., but cattle was the main driving force in that. Um, so he was looking at how this developed in the 18th and 19th century, um, and also trying to follow, physically follow and walk those droving routes to see if there was any landmarks or anything interesting that could turn up. Um, in the Stracker area, there was a local forester in Gilly, and I'm sure there's lots of other um, trades that he gets up to, but a um, very knowledgeable guy, lots of local knowledge. He knew people who knew things, and even people who had passed away who had left him stories on, on parts of the area. Uh, one of the sites that he did know about, although not the name specifically, he knew of a cattle stance that was on what he had heard was an old drover's route. Um, and so Donald, looking at his cartographic and documentary evidence and then listening to what Tom Hill had to say, they visited the site and, and a not so obvious rectangular structure was there and then that led to them looking in more detail at the maps and, and delving into the history of it. Um, I'll show you some of those maps in a second and some of the Google Earth images, so you'll get an impression of what they were looking at at the time. And the Royal Commission trained the members of the Stracker and District Local History Society in surveying, which enabled them, along with Donald and three other helpers, including uh, Kevin Grant, who's now in St Kilda, second year running, and they all did a plain table survey back in 2013, and which added a little bit of detail to what was basically a little rectangular grassy mound on the edge of a bit of forestry. Um, so that was a, a worthwhile exercise. And it led to the next stage where we planned an excavation in 2014 to investigate <coughs> some of the features that the plain table survey highlighted um, and to get some more information for Donald's postdoctoral research. And he was keen to find out more than just where these sites were. He wanted to know more about them. Um, so I'll just give you Ty Call and its, and its landscape. Um, you can see that this is the plain table survey that they completed. Um, there's the burn that runs along. You can just see the track. I'll put this more into context in a second. Uh, just trying to fit it on this slide. Um, 
But you can see the flint table survey has highlighted the rectangular building. It's approximately 20 meters long or thereabouts um, with the, what they thought was a possible internal division here. Um, um, there's lots of ideas that these might be double entrances and things, but it's it all very vague. You can see how it looked in 2013. Um, it, if you were walking across this landscape, you may be forgiven for not even noticing that it was there. It was so subtle. Um, especially, I, I remember when I visited it, it, it was taken to be pointed out um, before I could actually see it. There, just with the vegetation being so, so high. Um, this puts it in more of a Scottish context. You can see it's just in the Argyll, or the Kyle Peninsula in Argyll. Um, this is an indicative drover's route, which would have run the Creef and down to Butte. I know from talking to a few people today that there's people from Butte, and you may be familiar with some of these sites and cattle stances. And if you are, um, you'll be asking questions on it at the end. But you can see there's Ty Cole, and then just to the north and then the Creef. Um, this is indicative. It's not a perfect straight line by any means. <coughs> It does wiggle quite a lot in the landscape and it's very intermittent and it's, it's masked by roads and forestry in places. Um, but this, this shows the route to and from market from Butte where the cattle would have been swam across the little inlet here. So this is uh, an, an erratic which lies very close to Tycho. It may well mark the position of it. Obviously, this has been here long before Ty Cole, but Ty Cole perhaps was opportunistic in this bit already being a natural way marker in the landscape, and probably a way marker for the Drover's route. Um, it also has some mythical background, uh, kill glass. It's a, a, a mythical female archaic figure in cosmological you know, Gaelic tradition. It's, it's, it's sort of roughly translated as old grey lady or witch. So there's lots of little stories attached to features like this and um, they're quite common in the Highlands and, uh, and in Ireland as well. Um, so it, this possibly has some significance and uh, it's no coincidence that we've got an inn there. We've got a drover's route going past here. This is also close to the join between two parish boundaries as well. It's also close to the watershed between two burns where they go either side. So it's no coincidence that there's, there's a lot happening here and, and some of it's associated with this, this stone. There's lots of local stories about people witnessing witches walking across the road and things, and, but I'll not go into that today. Um, Telford even paid a little respect to the, the witch's stone, or the Caelic glass, and this bridge has the name Witch's Bridge still today. Um, and this, this goes across Telford's road which is a little hint to what might have been the demise of Ty Cole. Um, this was built in 1804-1811, which we think is probably around the time that Ty Cole was either um, tailing off or, or already had gone. Um, so here's an OS map. This is the first edition map. This is the last time that Ty Cole appears on any map. And by the second edition, nothing is shown at all. Um, you can see it's roofless. For those of you who are familiar with reading maps, you'll see that's a roofless building. It's also noted that it's in ruins. Um, this also suggests that it's not just Ty Cole, but there may well be other structures there that um, were perhaps prior to the survey in 1865. Um, so we'll, hopefully we'll go back again and we can look for that. Um, you can see here there's uh, more ephemeral <coughs> structures on the edge of the burn. We think this, this may be cattle stalling. Um, and you can see this is showing you roughly where the route goes. You'll see it much more clearly in Google Earth in a second. But this will show you where the route goes. Um, this is Telford's Road here. There's the Witch's Bridge. There's the Caelic Glass. And this blue line is the current A886, which uh, cuts off Telford's Road and, and obviously Ty Cole as well. So you can hopefully see. I've got the aisles in just to show. But you can see you can see the line very very clearly. You can follow this for another four or five kilometres further south, and then it disappears into forestry. Um, no doubt it's still there within the forestry, but you just can't see it with, with Google Earth. Um, I'll just show you the other features here. Tide call is very difficult to see. Well done if you've already spotted where it is. Uh, just highlight it for you, just in case, and just to reiterate where the two roads are: Telford's Road and the 
that's the current A886. You can see that they're only maybe 150 meters away from Tycho. Um, the land drops down quite a lot. Um, and it may be a reason why it's been cut off from, from the route and, and from trade. Um, just to put in better context, these images, especially this one, is a lot better. You can see the structure a lot more clearly here. Not so good uh, towards the end of the summer where the vegetation is high. And it's, apart from the discoloration, it's very difficult to see. And you can see quite well here. But you can imagine if someone's walking along, they probably wouldn't notice this unless they knew there was something to look for. Um, probably the best view point is from the burn edge, where you can see there's a lot more growth and a, a, a deeper colour of green in the vegetation there, suggesting there's perhaps organic remains below. And this is just one of the end stones of Tycho. So uh, this is the start of the excavation. And, and our main aim is for the excavation where, when was Tycho built or when was it changed to its purpose as an inn? And could we find anything from the excavations to confirm, yes, that it is an inn? It's not just a note in a name book. Um, and also, uh, we wanted to find out something about the lives of people who lived there and used that building. So you can see, we just starting to strip off the turf. We were quite modest at first in what we were aiming to do on the site. We had 12 days. We had some volunteers who put their names forward. And we knew there were some school children coming. We knew we had lots of support from the local community. And we had five Glasgow Uni students who had just, just about to graduate. They were in their we were waiting on the results coming through. They were very enthusiastic as well, but we were very modest. We decided on a few trenches across certain walls and parts of the building in the hope that we'd find enough artifacts to you know, pull together a report of some sort. Um, but the support we had was overwhelming. Um, and school children on a lot of projects, perhaps when they come along and have a look and a little scratch, the school kids on this occasion were very, very helpful. They managed to help us uncover lots of the wall around the outside of the building um, where we thought we wouldn't have time. Um, but there were so many kids and we were there for half a day at a time. And there wasn't that much turf over these stones as well. It was just once the grass was off, we had only a few inches to get onto the stones. And they actually found quite a few artifacts as well, which added to our assemblage. Little fragments of glass and some pottery. But it was all part of the bigger picture. So that was I'm sure it was great for them and their school, it was great for us, and it was great for the project and, and the site. Um, you can see we had a, our metal detectors. Uh, the little reconstruction that you saw sitting on our table today was made by Jim Conker, um, who's a keen military reconstruction guy, but he, he offered his free services to the local museum in Stracker to build them a reconstruction. He enjoyed the project so much, um, so he donated that to the museum. And they've loaned it to us for today, to sit alongside the, the edible version. <laughs> so you can see we, we trained the volunteers as well, um, and as best we could, and as many skills as we could. Um, so from excavation, recording, um, planning, sampling, including some micromorphology micromorpho samples, which we did of some of the floor and hearth deposits in one of the rooms. Um, with such nice stratigraphy there, I thought it was a, a shame not to get these samples while we were there. Um, these haven't been analysed yet, but it might be something we can do in future work. Um, and then some, some of the cataloguing of the finds, and we give people a chance on metal detecting, especially the school kids. They find metal detecting fascinating because it makes a noise when they find something. But you know, something for everybody. Um, so this shows you some of the school kids lined up along the wall. Um, and this is, I think if we're starting to go, but then this shows you the sort of size of the groups that we were getting. We are getting usually 25 at a time coming along. And we'll spend half a day and use our portal away, which I had to empty every day. And <laughs> it's good fun. Um, but the kids had a fantastic time. I mean, this is a site they had no idea existed. And most of the locals had never even or anything about a cattle stance, let alone a building that stood there. So this really put this little area on the map. And we had um, around 100 visitors during the 12 days as well, including some American visitors who made this one of their, their stops on their tour of the major sites in Scotland. So we were quite privileged to have them along. 
and they took some of the midges away with them, which wasn't a bad thing. <laughs> Um, so here's a plan, and you can pick out the, piss, the bit that you eat during your tea break time. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll show you where some of the features are as we go along, but you can see there's a little partition wall towards the, the rear of the building. We've got a little, not so well defined, central hearth, uh, another quite a well defined paved hearth at the rear, a little bench feature here. This is the passage between the two rooms. There's lots of collapse here and there. These blank areas we didn't excavate. Uh, but you can see we've got quite a good coverage. All the external walls were uncovered. The partition, the bench, some of the floor area we got here actually down to subsoil level. Uh, these trenches we took down to subsoil. And this we took down until, until we defined the heart. Uh, at the front we also took that down to subsoil and beyond into geological layers just to be sure that we weren't looking at earlier structures below this and also to find out if this terrace that Ty Cole sat on was it artificial or was it just a natural terrace carved by the meanders of the burn. So I'll just show you where all those little features are. There's the partition, there's our stone bench, fireplace, the other one, a little passage between the two rooms. And we've also got this lintel stone at the east end um, which suggests that there was an opening here of some sort. During the excavation we found no evidence of any hearth at this end, so we know it's not a, it's not a hearth. Um, we didn't find any header stones, which you can see here, coming across the wall. So we don't think there's been a doorway there, so it must have been a window. That's our, our, our conclusion on that. Um, the only other place where we think there might be an entrance is where these two header stones are. Um, it's the only place in the whole structure, I'm sure if you look around there, you'll see that that has happened. That suggests a structural weakness. There was also polish on this stone, so we think this is probably a former entrance into the building. Um, which it's, There's further evidence to add to that. This partition wall is built over the top of quite a lot of hearth layers that are built up and which extend out into the centre of the building. Uh, and there's only one or two very, very fine layers of hearth waste built up against this wall before Ty Call has gone. It's out of use. So the wall's quite late in the use of the inn. So we think this is the original entrance. And another contender is here where we found some sort of rough surface on the outside. Um, but um, definitely here we think it's a contender for the original entrance at least. And once this partition went in, we had to find some way in or out. So, um, the next contender is over this north side, which also faces the droving route coming to it, towards the building, so it makes sense to have a, an opening at that end for people to see you, that you're trading and you're, you're open for business. And here's a shot of, you see the lintel stone, quite obvious there, it's came down with the collapse, so we're outside the wall itself here, and this, is, this stone would have been upright, the stone you see in the foreground. And you see some quite substantial stones in the corner. Um, and these are the areas we didn't open up. Um, the little trenches in the middle that you would, you would have seen in the excavation plan. So uh, like I said before, with no evidence for a fireplace here, with no evidence for header stones or any entrance. So we think this is probably for a window. And this is a close up with no people in it, which is good sometimes just to see, to see the whole structure. No offence, people. Um, you can see the substantial stones that are holding a lot of the, the weight in the corner of the structure. You can see the lintel stone again. And you can see we've got this down to subsoil and, and beyond. This is towards the end of the excavation where we've done as much as we possibly could really within the time. Um, just to show you the thickness of the wall, the east gable end, it's almost twice as thick as anywhere else. Um, so again, suggesting there's an opening. The lintel suggests there's an opening. Um, so it's quite interesting, it's a bit stronger up this end. Very, very clean floor toward from this side of this central hearth. Um, we're not sure why that is, but we, we thought perhaps it's a sleeping quarters. Uh, you'll see from the reconstruction that the person who made the reconstruction has added a little bed box in at this end. It's sort of artistic impression, but given how clean it is, it's away from the main activity at the rear of the building. It's not near the hearth. So perhaps it is a sleeping area, and um, it needs more work to, to prove that, I would say. Um, this is the central hearth. You can see it's just sunk into the floor. This might look quite primitive, almost prehistoric, some people might think, but 
I have seen some of the literature and read in the publication that even in the early 20th century, there's little hearths like this with two, three people sitting around in the Hebrides and little long houses, not indifferent to Taiko. Um, just sitting around a little hearth, sunk into the floor, little kettle hanging over the top. So it might look primitive, but it's not that far, far away from, you know, from 70, 80 years ago, people were still doing the same thing. This is the hearth, it's a bit more formal than this little room at the back. Just imagine this partition isn't there because this is quite late. So this, this hearth is there, perhaps a wooden partition was there, something we haven't seen in our excavations. We haven't taken all of this material out. We've just taken sections through so we can see the different layers that are going on. And you can see some of the hearth layers that are built up and all this extends below this little wall foundation. So. And this shows you the fineness distribution, so hopefully you can see. We've labelled some of these as significant. These are ones that have had much more in-depth analysis on them. Um, but everything has been looked at in post excavation. Um, you can see there's much more of a concentration of different finds in this rear room. Although around the central hearth, we've also got lots of green glass. And we have a little uh, stone object, which I'll go into in a second. Um, we have a George II coin, which is found actually on the bench, just below one of the stones on the bench. Um, and we also had a little brass trigger guard, which is found here at the passage between the two rooms. Um, aside from that, on the, on the track or close to the track, we've got a fragment of a, an, eight, an 18th century horseshoe and a 19th century pewter, um, almost a thist thistle design, but it's called a, an hourglass shape. Um, harness keep, so a little belt keep. I'll show you images of these things in a second. You can see we've got quite a lot. A lot of this came from the school kids as well, just cleaning the walls um, outside the main trenches. So we've got a lot, we've got a lot of, out of the school kids coming along. And this is the building fully exposed. Um, and there's the burn. And here is where the drainage <coughs> track comes across and comes past the building. So just little airway just to show you. Um, the main road is just up here on the rise, just continues past. Um, Tyke Hall is quite tucked in, it's got this sort of natural amphitheater around it, so it's quite subtle and set in the landscape. This is a close-up of the drover's track. Um, we've got this very dense charcoal layer, which underlies these little dips, which, which we think are the main drover's track, and where it's worn through over time. Um, so we thought this was very interesting and after talking to Donald we decided to date this layer, thinking we would get a sort of 1800s date for it, something around that. Um, the analysis of the wood showed this was all, all of it, 100% birch and with the bark intact. And there was little or no other uh, macro botanical material, grasses, any other vegetation mixed with that. So uh, Susan Ramsey who did the archaeobotanical work and she thinks that it was laid on bare ground, so the wood was burnt in some way, laid on bare ground. Um, and this is a, a core drawing method. And um, Matt Ritchie, you're sitting there, I'm sure, even in forestry today, they use core drawing methods to get across rough ground in, in forestry situations and in the military. Um, but it's used as far back as the Neolithic period. So that this must have been some attempt to consolidate the track at this point. And it's no coincidence, it's beside the burn edge as well. So perhaps it's just strengthening the, that track on the burn edge. The, there is note of repairs to the drover's track in 1710. That's the earliest note of it. Um, so we expected maybe something around then or a little bit later. Um, so the, just going to go back to the there. Let's see. Sorry about that. So this is a selection of the finds um, that were recovered. And you can see uh, some of the glass. There's a little hourglass harness keep. There's the trigger guard that we found. It's also 19th century. The general vein of finds of 19th century. Um, the George II coins a little bit earlier, but it was still would be in set circulation. This little stone lamp. Um, this is usually an earlier object, so an earlier medieval <coughs> object. This was found when the central fireplace <coughs> type hole. Um, so it's hinting at possibly earlier beginnings. Um, so this 
So there are, like I said, general consensus from the findings of the 18th, 19th century period, which is in keeping with the cartographic and the documentary evidence for Tycho. But the crazy lamp suggests a little bit earlier, the horseshoe, which I haven't written here, and also the date for the charcoal that we found, the core drawing, and uh, gives us a 13th century date. So it's showing, it, showing us that this route was in use much, much um, earlier than, than we first thought. And there are other organic layers below that charcoal, which suggests it could be even earlier than that again. Um, so it's something that would be, nice be nice to look at further. So for the post decks, there's quite a lot of asbestos. A lot of them gave up their time for free as well to, to make this project happen. Um, so we'd like to thank all the, all the asbestos that were involved. So the, the route leading past Tank Hall had, had undergone repair, at least on documentary sources, in, uh, in 1710. We know, we know about that. That probably helped Tank Hall establish itself. Um, because there's better trade and the volume's increasing. There probably was an <coughs> entrepreneurial opportunity there um, and they took advantage of it. We're still not sure whether it was an existing building um, which was adapted to become an inn. The changing of the entrances suggests that might have been the case. Um, it was kind of hard to be conclusive on that. Um, the route was much more formally improved for wagon traffic in the early 19th century. Um, and Given the artifacts that we have, we're not finding any evidence of later occupation beyond that. So we think that t uh, Telford and Telford Road have led to the demise of Tyke Hall. Um, so it's, it, is, it is ironic that even in today's world, we see it where little settlements get bypassed um, for people to get to somewhere else a lot quicker, faster for trade or for whatever other reason, and it leads to. Uh, the life being sucked out of these smaller places. So Tycho, I guess in a little microcosm, is, is an example of that happening in the in the 19th century, the early 19th century. So, like I say, it's published on Tuesday past the 26th, which is exactly a year to the day when we first put our trial on the ground on 26th of May 2014. So, and this is free download for anyone who's interested in reading the, f the full story and the full post post-excavation analysis, and be a lot more detailed than what I've given you today. Um, and just to finish, I thought I would show you um, that we've left a little behind us, so hopefully someone comes along in 50 or 100 years and digs up this little tub with all our names and newspapers and coins and things inside. Um, so hopefully, hopefully I'll still be around and go back and dig it up myself. <laughs> um, but thank you very much for your time. Thank you.